you know, what better way to get buy-in and something of awesomeness when kids are the ones picking and designing what's going to come. And the teachers had voice as well. The administrators had voice. But now we created a brand new mantra, a brand new mindset. And it's all focused on we get to go to school here. Not we get to go to school here. It's we get to go to school here and what's coming next. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome back to this edition of Leading Through Unprecedented Times. I'm Tom Murray, your host, and I am ecstatic to have one of my good friends, superintendent and principal of Brigantine School District in New Jersey, and that is Glenn Robbins. You are in for a treat, my friends. Welcome back. Thanks for tuning in. Glenn, how you doing, my friend? I'm outstanding, Tom, and thank you for the generous intro. Absolutely. Such an honor. Tell us a little about Brigantine, your district, how long you've been there, and uh, we'll dive in. Uh, Brigantine is one of the best places to be in the summertime, I'll tell you that. We are just south, I'm sorry, just north of Atlantic City, a small barrier island. We have a one school district that has uh, pre-K to eight. We have under just under 500 students. And, um, you know, the best part about Brigantine is my office, our school, is three blocks from the beach. So we do a lot of outside resources and activities here. And I've been at Brigantine. Uh, I started in February 2020. So one month before the world ended and then tried to restart. So uh, it's been an interesting journey, but it I'm, sure it, journey. I'm sure it has. <laughs> I don't think you've had a normal month yet there, right, my friend? Well, listen, this theme of and by the way, I think you made everybody jealous listening to the podcast being like, did they just say the beach? It is February it is cold. But anyway, hey, our theme this time is for this season is really around resilience. And one of the things that we know, you know, educators, whether it's on social media in classrooms or through emails from the community, that people are getting battered left and right. And it is certainly a challenge out there. We call it like it is here on the Future Ready podcast, but there's also these stories of educators really coming through and, and running through adversity, doing what they need to for kids, seeking joy in those moments, shifting their lens. And our theme is really around resilience. So talk to us about a story around resilience, what it's looked like in Brigantine and, and give a shout to your educators or whatever it might be. Well, you're, you know what, you want to see how a leader is, you see who they're surrounded by. And I am surrounded by some incredible people where we are. It's not just our staff, but our scholars, our, our parents, our board members, our mayor, city council, um, you name it. And yeah, what, what educator right now is not going through the gamut of everything? Um, you know, one of the things I'm really big on um, history and philosophy and Marcus Aurelius is someone that's always really captured onto me. So when you use that quote and the paraphrase, of, you know, the beat of rock that battered against the waves and don't be, you know, don't move, just, you know, just continue to handle it and eventually it'll pass, you know, and from there in all that chaos, there are opportunities to, to arise. So when we talked as a team, it was, people are going to look at us to keep being calm, cool, collective and keep leading them through these situations because every day changes, no doubt. Like we we're every single day is something new being thrown on the plates of administrators. And I get the fact that we're tired. I said, I took on an extra position. I started as a superintendent. Now I'm also the principal, you know, and I felt it was in my nature that we could handle this to do it together with my team uh, to do that situation. But, you know, the resiliency is we take it day by day. We have the right mindset. People always talk about being innovative. The biggest innovative tool is your mindset. You know, you can have all the one-to-one devices. You can have all these different things in place and so forth. But we thought about what is the safety and security of our students to come back in, our scholars? You know, how do we as a parent and a lot of our administrators, a lot of our teachers are parents, you know, so we put that empathetic lens on it. So what would we want for our children to come through this door each and every day with the pandemic, with the, you know, all these uh, educational things that are in the news and so forth? How do we handle that? How do we communicate with that? And I think ultimately it was, you know, going back to that Marcus Aurelius quote that no matter what's thrown at us, we're going to get through it together. There'll be great days. There's going to be days where you're like one moment away from jumping out a window and quitting. And there's going to be other days where you're having the greatest day in your world. But we try to maintain that focus on what we're here for every day. So I can go on about a bunch of different things of the resiliency. But the best part about it was this island coming together as one. And we made it a theme. We call it a, you know, a small rock with a big heart. And the rock is known as Brigantine. So, you know, when, like I said, when we had city council, public works, emergency management, 
our mayor, our board of education, scholars, as well as parents, as well as teachers coming together to put together plans and how do we keep building on that? It brought out so much more communication that we've ever had. And how do we keep using those silver linings that we've learned to keep going forward? So a lot of excitement, a lot of headache, but you know, I'm excited for the fact of where we're going right now, you know, where we can keep going. So Absolutely. You know, Glenn, one of the things, one of the first memories I have of, I mean, we, you know, we've known each other for a long time, but I remember when you were a high school principal, when you were a principal, middle school principal, I believe in, a, in a, another, another district there in New Jersey, I remember stopping by one day and I come in and I think you were painting, you were moving boxes, doing things around. And I, I bring that back up and you might not even remember that moment, but I bring that back up. If somebody were to ask me about Glenn Robbins, well, the first thing that would come up would be around servant leadership. And one of the things that I see, whether it's seeing um, through this, the work that that's happening and bringing things that are being shared on on social media, things I've seen personally is you modeling the way and you being the person as a superintendent and principal now, not being afraid to get your hands dirty to also practice what you preach and also be able to say, Hey, if I'm going to ask my staff to do it, I'm going to be the first one, whether it's taking the garbage out, painting a wall, I'll do whatever I need to do as that leader. So I wanted to give you those kudos because the backside to that is I also look at you as an amazing innovator in that you're not afraid to push the limits. You're not afraid to do things differently. In fact, I think you probably take some pride in saying, we're not going to do it that traditional way. We're going to do some things differently over here. So tell us about some of the exciting things that even in the midst of two years into the pandemic that are happening in Brigantine that you're super proud of. Yeah. So, you know, I don't like the word change. I like the word uh, progress. Uh, maybe it's the process from being a Philadelphia guy too. Uh, but one of the things that I loved about, um, you know, Coach Dabo Sweeney, he talks about everybody goes through the process. But in order to make the process stronger, you got to have the relationships. So to your point about, you know, being hands on and what we're trying to do here is, you know, we have lengthy conversations. You got to love. You got to be empathetic. You got to be understanding, you know, of what these individuals have been through beforehand. You know, I can say this is a massive change for this, this island that we're on. But this island years ago experienced Hurricane Sandy and they persevered through it. So they learned from that to be stronger. Um, so when I came in, I was like, all right, well, what have you been doing? And asked a lot of questions. How could we do this possibly differently? And there was questions like, well, have you all been in the room before to have these conversations about what we could do differently? And it was breaking down those barriers. Well, you know, are you going to write me up wrong in my observation if my kids are sitting on the floor or doing some flexible seating or out in the hallway? You know, because they, they're unfortunately regimented to what they've had in the past. Um, you know, I'm, I've been told in the first two weeks that I was here, I was seeing more than I was than other people have been seeing in four or five years here. Um, I think that says something trying to gain understanding of the culture and the climate each and every day. You know, working with these, you know, our um, amazing association of teachers as well. But, you know, putting stuff together, what could we do differently? We set up a lot of design charrettes and so forth and brought in a couple of friends of ours to start talking about that, what we could do differently. Uh, but before we did that, I brought in people such as yourself, Tom. You know, when we were locked down that first year, I reached out to every person I could think of and say, could you please refill the minds, hearts, and souls of my staff who are working so hard doing something that we'd never done before? And you generously gave your time, yourself and so many others. Every Friday, we had a positive, you know, feed talk. And each person I asked, could you please just, you know, throw in a little bit about this particular area? to make my teachers and my staff and my powers and my families know that we can do things a little bit differently when we come out of this. And I think that really helped build that interpersonal relationships when we started talking about, you know, their own kids, their own families, you know, are they healthy? What's going on? What can we do for you mentally? Do you need the services here or there? You know, and then from there, when we got back into the building all last year, we had these design charrettes and we started talking about what could this space be? You know, to your point, you know, getting the hands dirty. Yeah, sometimes you have to model it. Sometimes you want the job done, you got to get it yourself and, and to lead the way to say, hey, if he's doing it, maybe I can do it too. And, you know, when we brought, and when we, especially when we brought the kids in, and when we designed an amazing design space called the Brigantine Commons, thanks to David Jakes leading that with us, um, I started going, when the furniture is starting to come in, and we're almost there. We're, obviously, the supply chain holds us up for a lot, but when I walked around the cafeteria that day and I said, hey, have you gotten up to the commons yet? And the kids looked at me like, no, we haven't. And I showed them pictures of some of the furniture. And they're like, I picked that. I helped design that last year. You know, what better way to get buy-in and something of awesomeness when kids 
are the ones picking and designing what's going to come. And the teachers had voice as well. The administrators had voice. But now we created a brand new mantra, a brand new mindset. And it's all focused on we get to go to school here. Not we get to go to school here. It's we get to go to school here and what's coming next. You know, so like I said, that mindset shift was the biggest innovative thing that we really pushed hard. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I can see a lot of the things you're putting out on social media related to that. What a great story about students saying, hey, I picked that or chose that. Let's follow up a little bit more with the learning space redesign. I know you've worked with David Jakes. I personally respect his work tremendously um, in some other areas there, really thinking it through. If you were to give advice to principal colleagues, superintendent colleagues that are listening today on, you know, where do I get started? Well, you know, I, how do I, with everything that we have going on, why would I spend the money on doing some things around learning spaces? Where do I even start in that process? You obviously just stared, you know, kids were a vital part of that. Walk us through just a quick process that you'd encourage people to go through if they were going to create some sort of commons or places that everybody could benefit from. And what, what kind of mindset should they have when going through that? Yeah, I think ultimately it starts at the front door. You know, when you cross that threshold into the building, when you cross that threshold into the front door of a classroom or whatever you call it, verbiage wise, to change their mindsets. Is it creating a moment of awe? Like, wow, I get to go into this room today or we get to go into this school and I can feel the energy? Or is it, uh, I got math today and I got this subject again. You know, so for me, it was, all right, we need to start looking at our spaces intentionally. So for, you know, going forward, my suggestions would be start asking questions. I'm sure there's a lot of ghost rules out there. Things that, you know, haven't been touched or changed for 20 plus years because it's always been that way and someone tried to do it. And then when you actually research it, no one changed anything. You know, a couple of buildings ago, a couple of districts ago, I asked about the paintings on the wall. No one could figure it out. And I heard every story there was. And eventually I tracked down after several weeks. Oh, that's what the designers of the building did when they came in and painted it. It had nothing to do with input. It had nothing to do with society of the community. It had nothing to do. It was just some guy randomly painting rooms. So my point is, ask those tough questions. Like, why do you have some murals on your wall that maybe could be changed? Could your stair places be differently? Could your, you know, hallways be used differently? Could your classroom be renamed to studios, learning labs, whatever it may be? But as you go forward, ask the kids what they want too. You know, when we sat down and we were talking to these kids, they said, you know, we need more, like we love video games. You know, can we, you know, we talked to our friends throughout the whole pandemic. It was the only way we were allowed to play with other kids. All right, so let's build an esports arena. And we're in the process of building that now. And I'm not just talking like throwing a couple of computers together. I'm talking like, let's make it comparable to a university at, you know, a middle school level, because that's what excites the kids to get into the building. You know, the learning space, our library, which we call the commons, was unused at the time. A bunch of books and obviously COVID prevented some of that from trying to, you know, cross population and so forth. But we kept saying, this isn't the center of the building. This could be a hub. How could we make this come back? You know, they, you know, we have a TV studio that had been non-existent for 15, 20 years after someone retired, you know, and people would say, we want to bring it back. And my response was, well, anybody can bring it back. You just have to have the willingness to do so. So I jumped in and then I grabbed a couple of really great teachers at the student council and said, hey, you want to help me out? You want to get involved and celebrate these kids? It has exploded to a point where I'd never anticipated for this year because the kids are full voice and choice right now. So, you know, asking those questions, being open and being, hey, when they say, can we possibly do something? Follow through on that. You know, I couldn't tell you how many times a leader was asked to do something or try to do something and it's a maybe and a maybe is a no. You know, be honest with your staff and be open with your your scholars as well and say, all right, we can do this. It's going to take some time. It's going to take a little effort, but we can do this. Your school, how many hours a day? It's your place of home. You need to make it exciting and fun. If not, the kids are going to feed off your energy just as much, and they're going to take that home. And then you're going to have parents questioning everything that's going on in that building. Yeah, I absolutely love that, Glenn. And, you know, it, it radiates in everything that you've shared, everything that you've talked about. My, for my next question is, there, you know, relationships, your people, your staff, you continue to give them shout outs, you continue the student voice. I get so excited listening to you. And I'm sure our listeners today can really uh, agree with why I was so excited to have you on the podcast. And here's the thing, you are such a student centered or, you know, that learner centered environment that you're creating, but it's also about the adults and the relationships that you have, the care and compassion. And I know you're also somebody that 
that's more than willing to have a needed conversation if if there is one that that needs to happen. But at the same time, the compassion and the empathy that you lead with the lens that you have for your staff that I know you don't just value the SEL side, the home, the humanistic side for students, but you do for your staff there as well. I know you started to mention a little about some of the things that you're doing on Fridays and those kinds of things, but you know, what encouragement or inspiration or thoughts do you have for your, your colleagues around the country, superintendents and principals about how to take care of their staff right now? You know what, that is, you know, there, there are so many things that go into a district, but the number one crucial component for anything is human capital. It is your human beings in this, in this building. You know, those, those teachers are doing so much, you know, and I'm tired of the cliche of bashing education. These people are rising up to a level that never had been asked upon them. Leaders, educators, the parents, the kids, but our educators go into work every single day and they are Zooming while they're teaching at the same time, you know, the kids that are home and quarantining. They are doing so much on that mental burden. And if they're not mentally taken care of, then we're doing something wrong. You know, my post observations after, you know, talking about the pedagogical practices and so forth. It's okay, okay. Now we're shifting gears. How's your family? You know, how are you doing? You know, is there a reason why you may not be coaching this year? Is there a reason something else is going on? You know, and ultimately, what can I do? Can I cover your class for a day? Can I do your duty? You know, can I, you know, implement a new program if we need it for your staff, whatever you guys are asking for? But that human capital is so crucial. So crucial. And we forget about that at times. We get so stuck down in the bureaucracy of the world or we're beaten down and we take it out on them. And, you know, a smart person does not do that. They don't take it out on the, on the others. They take it out on themselves and they internalize and reflect. And I think that's something I really learned as a, as a leader throughout the pandemic. It really made me shift gears to see it in a totally different leadership perspective. Um, so, you know, besides the, the positivity speakers such as yourself and some mega offers that have come through and other educators that are practitioners that are going through it every single day and offering this candid advice that they needed to hear to replenish themselves. You know, we also teamed up with, you know, the Orange Frog Initiative with uh, Devin Hughes had come in. And, you know, we're going, we came in at the beginning of the year, incredible PD has now had virtual sessions with our staff throughout the year, as well as with parents, uh, which is kind of great because the virtual allows more people to attend. You don't have to rush home, you don't have to rush to a gymnasium, you don't have to rush to get childcare. Um, we also brought in Damon West, you know, the author of the, of the coffee book bean. Um, talk about a remarkable individual that brings the power and energy to a speech. And we brought him in. I had some educators saying that's the best professional development I've had in 15, 20 plus years because he was speaking from the heart, from experience. And it was hitting them saying he's been through adverse situations and I can, too, you know. And I had some people relate to some of his story on some of the background and family members that we have, you know, and then then. And in just a couple of days, I'm bringing in Chris Singleton, you know, a good friend of yours as well. And I'm telling you, and I know you preach his praise all the time, but if you have not looked up Chris Singleton yet, you are missing out. And I am beyond ecstatic to bring him in. And the best part about that, Tom, is actually we sat to the Boys and Girls Club of Atlantic City and said, hey, can we team up and make this a regional event? I think this is going to help, you know, the students over there. It's going to help the students over here on both islands. And let's make a big difference. So once again, it's trying to fill those souls and the minds and the hearts of our educators each time that we are intentionally thinking about what can be done to help them mentally. Absolutely. And yeah, you're sharing about two of my good friends and Chris, we had on the podcast last season. We actually will give a, a little bit of a heads up. Damon's going to be on the podcast here, Future Ready, later this season. Their stories are incredible. Their stories of through adversity, kind of what we're talking about through their, their stories of resilience are absolutely remarkable. So thank you for sharing those and bringing those up. So we've got one final question for you. You've offered so much inspiration, so much hope, so much encouragement just in your words here in the podcast. What's something that gives you hope right now moving forward as we look to the the rest of this year? I think what gives me hope is I'm also a dad and I have a nine-year-old and I have a two-year-old and I know you're a dad too. See what has been transpiring the last couple of years and see what these educators are doing and where we're going. It gives me a lot of hope. Um, I recently just brought my son to my district. That's how much I believe in this place now. And, you know, it, obviously family issues prevent him from coming before, but you know, he wants to be here and now he's stepping up in a whole nother level. And that's because I believe in what my staff is doing. 
I believe in where we're going. And I believe that they are putting every ounce of their heart into their work each and every day. And that gives me so much hope as an educator, as a father, um, you know, of where the world could be. So ultimately, I guess my last message in that regard would be, don't give up. You're making such a tremendous difference. Whether you realize it or not, you're going to wake up and you're going to meet disturbed people. You're going to meet angry people. You're going to meet happy people, no matter what it is. You're going to meet everybody. But you control the controllables. And if each day you come in and put a smile on my kid's face or somebody else's kid's face, and they're going home feeling that they can love, secured, and all the things that people have realized the schools do during a pandemic, that gives me so much hope for where we can go going forward. So brilliantly uh, said, my I friend. think that's it. I appreciate <laughs> your time. Last question real quick. How can people follow your work or the work happening in Brigantine? Yeah, so um, I'm on a couple of different platforms, but the handle is all the same. It is Glenn R, G-L-E-N-N-R. 1809, 1809. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, and so forth. But um, and, and Len, one last caveat, Tom, they want to reach out to me at the school district, looking up Brigantine, give me a call. I'd be more than happy to talk to anybody. And, and we're all going through this together. I know it's cliche, but I'm sincere about that. We're only as good as the people around us, and we got to keep pushing each other to be better for the kids. That's awesome. Your servant heart radiates, my friend. That is Glenn Robbins, everybody. Glenn, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for tuning in.